I'm going to go ahead and get started here. This is session 16 in our class, Indwelling Life. This is session 16, Renewing the Mind. And I mentioned this in the earlier, but we're, we're, I'm going to spend probably four to six teachings uh, on renewing the mind because it's so important. The way you think is going to be determined the way you live. And it's so vital that we learn how to renew the mind. If we're going to live by the Spirit from the Spirit, renewing the mind is essential. And so a lot of us wonder why our life is such a mess. It's because your mind is a mess. And if your mind is a mess, you'll never live in victory. So that's why we've got to gain control of our thinking and we've got to renew our mind purposely so that the life of Jesus Christ that is in you, your spirit is one spirit with the Holy Spirit, that divine life of God that is now joined to your spirit, spirit to spirit, must be released and the mind is the determining factor of whether or not that life of God is released or not. And so I want us to turn right now to Philemon uh, chapter 1, verse 6. Philemon is a very obscure book. Not a lot of times uh, people quote or teach out of Philemon. But it's uh, Philemon 1, 6. Paul's writing. This is a really, I want you to just encourage you to read Philemon 1, 6. Think about it. Meditate on it. It is, it is so powerful when we understand what Paul is telling us in Philemon verse 1, or chapter 1, verse 6. Paul said, I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. Now you read that and you go, okay, this seems like a normal, normal verse, but I want to break this verse apart and just kind of unpack for us what Paul is saying. I want to break apart three, four different words, faith, effective, knowledge, and this is really not a word, it's a phrase, every good thing in you. I want to break those apart so we understand what Paul is trying to drive home here in this, in this verse. Now, let's talk about faith first. And I can't, um, faith is critical. Faith is critical. See, we, ha and I mentioned in a long session way back when, is you, you are a spiritual billionaire, I mentioned Ira Yates. You're a spiritual billionaire. He had, he had millions and millions of dollars underneath his feet, but he didn't know because of ignorance. Okay, so we can't claim ignorance now because we've been in this teaching for about, you know, I don't know how many sessions, 19, 18, 20 sessions. I'm not exactly sure. But we've been laying on, on the, what God has said about you, and we've been, you know, you cannot, we can't really claim ignorance right now. But there's two things that stop life, the life of God, from flowing from the inside out. And number one is ignorance. Number two is unbelief. And I would say right now, the thing that would hinder us most would not be ignorance, but would be unbelief. Is we don't believe what God's Word says about us. We don't believe what uh, Jesus Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. We don't believe what he's done in our spirit. We don't believe the transformation he's done. Or maybe we have forgotten it because it's easy in the everyday life to forget things. So we need to remember who we are. We need to remember what Christ has done for us and done in us. But faith is so critical. Faith is so critical. I'm going to read Hebrews 1 or Hebrews 11.1. 1. You don't have to turn there. I'm just going to read it. In the Darby translation, it's not, this is, this, is not the be, this is not a great translation of Hebrews 11.1, 1, but I think it expresses for us what faith does in the indwelling life. And this verse says, now faith is the substantiating of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith, your faith substantiates. Your faith causes you to experience what's already true. Your unbelief also allows what's true not to be experienced. So if you're not experiencing life, if you're not experiencing victory, if you're not experiencing what God's Word says, most likely there's a faith problem that needs to be handled by the renewing of your mind. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Okay, so when it comes to experiencing the indwelling life of Christ, faith substantiates. Faith gives form or substance. 
Faith is what makes it real in your experience. Faith activates life. Faith is how you experience what the Word of God says about you. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by meditation. Is I'm going, to re- I'm going to read some, I'm going to show some slides here as we go through this. Is faith in God's facts, listen to this, faith in God's facts, I got this from Watchman Nee, faith in God's facts allows the spirit to make it real in your experience. Okay, there is faith for God's promises. I need healing, I need provision, I need breakthrough. I need deliverance. I need these things. There's faith for God's promises, and all that's really good. We need faith for God's promises. But what I'm talking about is not faith for God's promises in this teaching. I'm talking about faith in God's facts. What has already been accomplished, what Jesus has already accomplished for you on the cross, what Jesus has already done in your spirit, faith in what he's done on the cross Faith in what he's done in your spirit and how he's transformed you. Faith in God's facts is how you, is how this, listen, it allows the spirit to make it real in your experience. Everything I'm teaching right now is meant to be experienced. It's not meant just to be up here as knowledge. It's meant, his life in you is meant to be experienced Not just on Sunday, but every single day. Amen. Faith in God's facts. Believing what God has already accomplished. Believing that is what allows the Holy Spirit to make it real in your experience. The Lord only moves by faith. Read the Gospels. Jesus did not move because of their unbelief. The Spirit of the Lord in you will only move when you believe. If you don't believe, he won't move. He won't won't release his life. Faith is how the life of God in you is released. And how does faith come? Faith comes by renewing the mind by meditation. And I don't mean new age meditation. Don't think of like sitting in, you know, yoga position, palms up in some kind of yoga pants. Please don't envision me in yoga pants. That would be awkward. But, okay, I'm not talking about New Age. I'm not talking about Hinduism in terms of meditation. I'm talking about biblical meditation. We'll walk through that in this series within a series of what it means. But faith comes uh, by renewing the mind by meditation. Faith comes by hearing. So as I'm, see what happens, here's the dynamic. As I'm preaching, here's the dynamic that's going on is you're hearing and faith is beginning to be activated within you. That's why hopefully when you leave on Sundays, you don't leave in a bad mood, you leave in a good mood, hopefully, unless I'm telling, talking about the end times or something. But faith is what activates by hearing. As you hear God's truth preached, it, it activates faith. And that activation of faith causes you to experience spiritual energy so the life of God in you can be released. God's facts are what Jesus finished for you on the cross and what the Spirit finished for you in your spirit. Faith in God's facts is the key. This is the key. Faith in God's facts This, if you feel like you're not experiencing this, here's the reason why. Nine times out of ten, here's the reason why. Is because you don't have faith for it. Because you're not believing it. Or you forgot it. Is faith in God's facts is the key that allows the Spirit of God to make it real in your experience. For you to experience His life in your heart, soul, and body. And then finally... Faith is the conduit through which God's inward grace, his power, you know, we spent two sessions about grace. That inward grace of God that enables you to be who God's called you to be, that enables you to do what God's called you to do, that gives you power to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. That grace of God is inside of you, but that grace of God will not be active and will not flow unless there is faith that is a conduit that releases that grace from your spirit into your heart and into your soul. Faith is the conduit through which God's inward power, His grace, flows. So that's why it's so vital that we walk in faith. 
Everything in the Christian life is about faith. faith Romans, I think it's Romans 1.17. Faith, it, that, that the, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith from first to last, from beginning to end. Everything is by faith. Faith is that key. Faith is that key that unlocks it. So faith is critical. How do we activate our faith? That's the next word we want to look at here is this word effective. This, this word effective is the Greek word effective is energes. Energes. It's the, this word means active, effective, productive, powerful in action. It's actually where we get the English word for uh, energy. Energy is, is really what to... What God wants, what faith is, faith, you can think of faith as the spiritual energy drink. If you ever feel spiritually lethargic, if you ever feel spiritually lukewarm or apathetic, most likely what's happening, I'm not talking about spiritually here, most likely what's happening is your faith has not been activated. And we got to activate our faith every single day. See, it's like to, to get our faith activated, we have to activate our faith every single day by renewing the mind. Faith and the renewing of the mind, they go hand in hand. You cannot separate the two of them. Faith is like this energy drink you drink. It's like a latte. It's a great latte. It reminds me of this time. I remember um, I was wanting to move away from normal coffee to more lattes. And Michael and Jeanette, I don't know if you remember this, you gave us your latte machine. And I tried to use it without watching instructions or reading about it. And oh my goodness. I made a latte, I don't even know what I made, but I made a latte, and it, I mean, I was, my, my, my face was red the whole day, I was sweating, I was talking about a million miles an hour, and I was like, you know, Angie was like, you know, I felt my heart was beating out of my chest, I mean, I got a lot done, but I mean, I was like, it didn't feel very good doing it. I've since have switched to making lattes at our house, we got to, we, now I know how to make them, and they're great, but you know, I really can't start the day without having my latte. It's like the energy that gets me going. Well, that's kind of what faith is like. Faith is your latte. Faith is that energizing force of your heart that energizes. And, you know, you can start, fe you can feel when, when you start feeling the faith, when you move from a state of doubt, unbelief to a state of faith, you can feel it. It's this, this, acti this activity, this actionable thing going on in your heart. And that action, that energy then releases the Spirit of God to move. Okay. The next word we're going to look at here is knowledge. This word knowledge is a deep word. It's, it's a word in Greek that means, it's the word epigenosis. But it's a precise and a correct knowledge. It's not just a head knowledge. It's a, it's a knowledge that comes out of relational experience. The knower, this is what it means, the knower experiences relationally the object known. Obviously that's talking about our relationship with Christ, but it also is also this experience, it's, it's the experience of truth. See, truth is never meant to be lodged away in your brain as knowledge that you know. That's living from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Truth is meant to be in your heart as, an, as energy, as life, as, as, as this force of God that releases God's life outward. See, this, this word means recognition, full discernment, acknowledgement. It's a fuller or full knowledge. It's a greater participation in the knower, in the object known. It's a really deep Greek word. So Paul's basically saying is that your faith might become energized by full and precise knowledge. Now, just kind of just breaking this down, there's three components of this word that I think about. Number one is discovery. is discovering the truth of God's word by studying and properly interpreting scripture. So we got to discover what the truth is in the word of God. We got to discover, we got to search the scriptures. We got to we got to be in the scriptures. We got to be, you know, studying and understanding it and, and realizing, okay, what is God speaking here through these scriptures? And from this truth we've gleaned from our mind is then we don't want that truth to be lodged in our brains. We want it to be experienced in our heart. And this is where we experience this in our spirit to spirit relationship with Christ. 
And that's by revelation. It's when truth on a page becomes truth in my heart. It's when what Paul, when Paul was writing, let's say the book of Romans, and he was writing the book of Romans, the revelation Paul had is meant to become the revelation you have. See, it's not just to be something you read and you, get a, you form a doctrine about it. It's meant to be, no, the revelation that Paul had when the Spirit of the Lord inspired him to write these scriptures is meant to be the revelation you have, your own revelation. Does that make sense? It's meant to be your own. That's what ownership means. That's what it talks about in the parable of the sower. They didn't have firm root in themselves. They didn't have ownership. That truth on a page had not become truth in the heart. And that's what we need. That's what we have to have. Is Lord, when we, when we begin to practice biblical meditation, we're saying, Lord, let the truth on this page become the truth in my heart. I would encourage you to pray that. As you're reading, as you're meditating, as you're studying the scriptures, is I want the revelation Paul had. I want the revelation John had. It's, it's, that's what the Bible is about. I want, God wants us all to have that shared revelation. Is that they're the, they're the forerunners, they're the ones that introduced it, but it's meant to be their revelation becomes your revelation. That's why, is, you know, some people are, have gotten bored with the Bible and we're all about, okay, give us something new. We want to hear something new. What is the Lord saying new? And obviously, we're, we believe in what is God saying in this hour. We just had a whole time in worship about what God is saying to us right now. But I think in the charismatic church sometimes, we get so addicted to the new that we don't go into the ancient. You know, Jeremiah talked about, Jeremiah talked about go down the ancient past. This word is alive. This word is alive and active. And when that word, the Spirit of God, is breathing on that word, you can experience and you can, listen, I just want to tell you this. You are meant to have the same revelation Paul had. The same revelation James had. The same revelation John had. That revelation they received by the Spirit of God that inspired them to write the Scriptures is meant to be the same revelation you have. And that comes by study and it comes by meditation. Thinking over it over and over and over and over until that truth is inscribed on your heart. And when that happens... When you be, experience that and you acknowledge the truth you receive by meditation, what happens is you begin to experience a metamorphosis. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, a lot of us are, are waiting for God to bring transformation when God is saying, I want you to initiate it. Well, how do you do that? Romans 12, 2 you renew your mind. You change. So what happens when, when you renew your mind, you change states. The caterpillar is a butterfly just in a different state. He metamorph the caterpillar metamorphosizes into a butterfly. And you, when you meditate, you metamorphosize from, the, from a carnal state, a soulish state, into a spiritual state. Meditation transforms you, metamorphosizes you. Does that make sense? See, if we, don't, if we are not active in this process of diligently, with discipline and practice, and, and over and over in our minds, if we're not diligently meditating, if we're not diligently renewing our mind, we will by default be conformed to this world. We will be conformed to this world. God wants us to be renewed. God wants us to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. So, epigenosis is discovering the truth by study and interpretation, experiencing the truth by revelation, and acknowledging the truth by meditation. Now, what exactly does Paul say we are to meditate on in Philemon 1.6? He says, every good thing in you. Now, he's not talking about the goodness of man 
in the, in the soul. You know, those good attributes. All of us have some good attributes. He's not talking about meditate in ye, on how good you are in your soul. He's talking about meditating on the good that's in you because of Jesus Christ. He's talking about meditate on who it is that is inside of you. I, I say there's, there's three categories here. This, when Paul says the good that is in you, to meditate on the good that is in you, three things, who you are in Christ, who Christ is in you, and how he has transformed your spirit. We need to meditate on all three of those things. See, who, is, who you are in Christ, in Jesus Christ, when you were saved, when you were born again, the Spirit of the Lord baptized you into the body of Jesus Christ. When you were baptized into the body of Jesus Christ, you experienced union with Jesus Christ. You became a partaker in God's eyes of his crucifixion, of his death, of his resurrection. You became one who has ascended into heavenly places. You became one who is now enthroned. You became an overcomer. That is who you are in Jesus Christ. Not who you are on your own, but who you are in Christ. You are righteous. You are justified. You are an overcomer. You have sat down with him on his throne. You are crucified. You are dead. You have been resurrected into new life. Meditate on that. Think about that. That is, never meant, that is meant to be part of our daily meditation and prayer every single day, is that I have died in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ, by God's doing, I am, in, I am in Jesus Christ, who has become to me wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification. You are in Christ by God's doing. How did you get into Christ? By God's doing. It's not something we can figure out with our minds. It's by God's doing. The Spirit of the Lord puts you into Christ. A beautiful truth. Who you are in Christ. Now also, who Christ is in you. We would be very, you get very bored if you're just meditating on the goodness that's in you. Meditate on who Christ is in you. Christ is the Shekinah glory of God in you. Christ is the living water that's inside of you. Christ is the anointing. Christ is the truth. Christ is the helper. You have inside of you access to the mind of Christ. Christ in you is that resurrection power that raises dead things to life. Christ in you is enabling grace to do what God's called you to do and be what God's called you to be. Christ in you is creative power. Christ in you is the kingdom of God. You have in, immeasurable wealth inside of you. Meditate. See, it's like meditation is like using the prepaid debit card. You've got all this money. Well, not all this money, but you've got some money, depending on the, the size of the gift. You've got this money that's given to you. If you never exercise that prepaid debit card, you will never receive the gifts you could have received. You've got to use the debit card. It's like meditation. You've got to use that by reminding of yourself who it is that lives inside of me by meditation. You, you got to do this every day. You got to you, every day. You got to wake up and you've got to seize the day. You got to seize the day and you got to say who Christ is in me, who I am in Christ. You got to think about this often, every day. Think about this, or you will forget about it. And if you forget about it, you will live a soulless, carnal life. Not only do you need to think about who Christ is in you and who you are in Christ but also meditate on how he has already transformed your spirit. A lot of believers go around thinking, oh, I'm this hopeless hypocrite. I'm this worm. I'm never going to amount to anything. God's mad at me. I'm unworthy. I'm unholy. I'm never going to get victory. And they just wallow around in self-pity, looking introspectively inside of them, and they never see who it is that is in them. That's not what you're meant to do. That's not what you're meant to think about. You're meant to think about how he has transformed your spirit. Do you realize this? When God regenerated you, when you were born again, you became an entirely new creation. Your spirit is now created in righteousness. Your spirit is now created in holiness. I'm quoting Ephesians 4.24. Your spirit is now Christ-like. Your spirit is complete. Your spirit is a partaker of the divine nature. 
Your spirit is one spirit with the Holy Spirit. That is incredible. Meditate on what he has done in your spirit in transforming you that I am my, Lord, thank you that you have made my spirit righteous and I am a saint, not a sinner anymore, though I struggle sometimes with sin. Thank you, Lord, that you have made my spirit Christ-like. Thank you that I am one spirit with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter. We, we, you know, we, me and we were driving to prayer the other day, and mom and dad were like, they're so afraid now to say, oh, I just feel dead, because I'm like, oh, <clears throat> pull out the card. You're not dead. That's the way you feel. We're joking about that. But you, know, you, you can have bad days, and you can feel bad. But I, here's the thing. Is your spirit is one spirit with the Holy Spirit. Don't forget that. Don't forget it. Think about it. Meditate on that. See, biblical meditation, biblical meditation activates your faith. If your faith feels dormant, if you don't feel that spiritual energy, if you don't feel like you've had that, that latte, a lot of times it's your faith that has become dormant, and you've got to activate your faith. The good news is that you don't have to wait for Sunday to hear a preacher. The good news is, is you can do this every single day. You can be your favorite preacher. I mean, you already love to hear yourself talk more than you love to hear others talk anyway. Why not turn it into your own sermon you preach to yourself? I mean, you, you know, husbands and wives, you know what we're talking about. The wife comes and starts talking for like, sorry, I'm going to say the husband. The husband comes and starts talking for like 15 minutes and the wife's like, okay, can you make it into bullet points? We love to hear ourselves talk. A activate your faith by speaking. Preach these things to yourself. Write these things down. Sing these things. You, you can't just get it by reading. Reading's good, but that's not meditation. Studying is good, but that's not meditation. Meditation is this involved act of confession. It's this involved act of meditation, churning it over and over, speaking it, writing it, singing it, proclaiming it, praying it. It's this whole immersive process that you can do to activate your faith. I promise you, if you will begin to incorporate biblical meditation into your life, your life will change. Now, renewing the mind is not a one-time thing, okay? A lot of us have been thinking really stinking thoughts for a long, long time. You cannot just renew your mind in one day and think, okay, it didn't really work. No, you've got to be committed to a process of renewing the mind day in and day out as a practice, as a habit, just like exercising. You've got to just practice this every day. Incorporate meditation into your prayer life. Here, here's an example that, that helps me think of what meditation does. I, 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 you've seen The Lion King, you know, this, the, the Lion King, I can't remember when it came out. That, that, uh, just one step back, let me say this. There's this movement for some reason in the church today called At The Movies. I don't know if you've seen that. It's, it's floating around on Twitter. It was, it was on Twitter last week. You know, people were, you know, one megachurch pastor was dressed up like Woody and his wife was dressed up like Bo Peep and they were trying to like exegete Toy Story and talk about how there's biblical principles in Toy Story we need to learn from. And other people transformed their worship service, their, their sanctuary into Jurassic Park or Star Wars. And others were trying to exegete Bob Barbie and say, okay, Bar I'm like, you cannot get anything spiritual that's in the Bible from Barbie. I'm sorry. There is just nothing in Barbie that has anything to do with the Word of God. It's just total nonsense. A, anyway, hopefully you don't like Barbie. But <clears throat> my point was, God's got a sense of humor because I was really like, this is so ridiculous. Why are we doing at the movies? And I hadn't thought about, okay, the next session I'm going to do is I've got, a, I've got a movie example. And God was kind of setting me up here with a little bit of divine humor to be like, oh, okay, maybe, Brian, you shouldn't judge them so harshly. But some of it needs to be judged harshly. But maybe you should be a little bit more less judgmental, you know, just God's sense of humor. But anyway, God, God likes to do that in his divine sense of humor set you up, and I'm like, okay, Lord, but the, some of it needs to be, come on. Anyway, I won't go there. Lion King example. You've seen Lion King, and, you know, one of my favorite parts of the movie is when Simba, he's, you know, feeling this, this time of dejection, and he goes, and he, he, he goes to this pond, 
and he sees a reflection of his father, and his father then is in heaven, and he says, he says, Simba, you have forgotten me. And he says, how have I forgotten you? He says, he, and I'm probably misquoting this, but he says, Simba, you have forgotten who you are, therefore you have forgotten me. And he said, Mufasa says, Simba, remember who you are. Remember who you are. See, that's what meditation does. Meditation helps us to remember who we are. Now, I'm not talking about who we are in and of ourselves. I'm talking about who we are in Christ, who Christ is in us, and how he has transformed our spirit. See, a lot of times what happens is we have learned this, we have heard it, but if we don't have biblical meditation as a practice into our prayer life, then what happens is that 20-part series we did on Indwelling Life, of all those incredible truths, what happens is we forget who we are. And I believe the Lord would call us to say, remember, church, who you are. You are a child of the Most High God. You are betrothed to Jesus Christ. Your sins have been forgiven. You are the righteousness of God in him. You have been crucified. You are dead, buried, and resurrected. You can now walk in newness of life. You have the grace of God inside of you. You can draw from his grace within at any moment. Your faith can activate his grace at any moment to live by the power of God inside of you. You have Shekinah glory, rivers of living water. You have the truth, the anointing, the helper. You have access to the mind of Christ. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are. Remember who you are. Church, remember who you are. Meditation helps you remember who you are. Thinking over and over and over and over in prayer. Thanking the Lord for what he's done. Helping you to remember who you are. Actually, I have a, my notes are, got it a little bit twisted here. But anyway, I am going to just say this. The, Dr. Caroline Leaf, um, Dr. Caroline Leaf, who is a neuroscientist, was explaining, because a lot of people get confused. They think, they think your brain and your mind are the same thing. But the brain and the mind are not the same thing. When you die and go to be with the Lord, your mind, which is part of your soul, is going with you. Your brain is staying in the ground. And so what we need to understand as we get into meditation is the mind and the brain are not the same. It's kind of the way I think about this is the brain is like a computer. It has the hardware, the circuit boards. And this, the brain is like a computer and the mind is like the operating system that controls the computer. Does that make sense? The mind and the brain are not the same thing. And so you can actually, what, what can happen is over time, you can develop terrible thinking patterns. And these terrible thinking patterns you develop can reshape the, the brain and it can cause you to be a certain way. But you can take control of that by meditation. I'm talking about meditating on the truth of God's word. Is reshaping the brain by meditation in the mind. And so it's so important that we, that we learn to, to meditate. And so here's the question is, where do thoughts originate? Where do thoughts originate? Just I'll answer that in a second. But I don't know if you've thought about this, but your mind is comp comprised. And I'm talking about your, not your brain, your mind, your the, the mind being part of the soul is composed of trillions and trillions of thoughts. On average, you'll have somewhere between 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Now listen to this. There was a study done by the National Science Foundation that found that 80% of people's thoughts were negative. <laughs> I would agree with that. I mean, just... I, I mean, unless you're different than me, I wake up and my mind is just thinking negative thoughts. If I don't proactively renew my mind, my mind is just geared to be negative. 80% of your thoughts, according to this study, are negative thoughts. 
nothing good happens to me, I'm unworthy, I'm unholy, God's mad at me, I'm never going to be who God wants me to be, I failed in life. You know, it could be a million different things. I'm never going to do what God's called me to do. You know, why, do, why are these people blessed and I'm not blessed? Why do bad things always happen to me? These negative thoughts, 80% of, the, of your thoughts are negative thoughts. Negative thoughts about yourself. I'm unworthy, I'm not pretty, I'm not in shape, whatever. It could be a million different things. I don't think about myself being pretty. I'm just saying what some people might. Uh, 95 per, and, and especially if you have a teenage daughter, they'll point out to you that, how unpretty you are and all of your flaws that you have. But 95% of the thoughts that we think are a repetition from the day before. And so by default, your brain, your mind, by default, your mind is negative. By default, it's on, your mind is on repeat. Repeating the same things over and over and over and over. And so it's so important for us that we learn to get control of the way we think. Because as we'll look at in a second, your thinking determines whether you live by the Spirit of God, by the soul, or by the flesh. Your meditation deter determines your orientation. How you think determines how you live and what part of you you live from. Whether you live from the cravings of your body, whether you live from your spirit, or whether you live from the soul. How you think determines how you live. It's so important that we, that we really get an understanding of our brain, our thinking, our mind. Okay, so where do thoughts originate from? I got seven sources of thoughts. And a lot of times what happens is all of these things, you, a lot of times are so intertwined, they're hard to separate. But your thinking comes from your brain your thinking comes from cells in your body, number two. Your thinking comes from your mind, number four. Your thinking comes from your heart, number five. Thoughts come from your spirit, number six. Thoughts come from the indwelling spirit, and then number seven. Thoughts come from demons. Okay, so in this teaching, you know, Dad's got a whole excellent teaching on deliverance that if you want to know about thoughts from demons and deliverance, you can check that out on RadicalPursuit.net. This teaching is really focused on the thoughts that come from your mind and your heart. The thinking that comes and the, the reasoning, the logic, and then those thoughts of uh, heart beliefs. And so some people go, okay, well, how do, you, how do you make the distinction between a thought that comes from your mind and a thought that comes from your heart? or a thought that comes from your spirit. And I think it's important to understand how you make that distinction. As here's the way I think about it, is thoughts that come from the mind are based in logic and reason. You reason it out. You think it through logically. That's usually the thoughts that come from the mind. The thoughts that come from the heart usually come deeper down, and they're thoughts that come from what you believe and what you desire. So as we're going to see, as we get deeper in this teaching, the vital importance of heart beliefs because what you believe in your heart will always transmit upward into your mind. And if you have wrong beliefs that are not rooted in Scripture, it's going to naturally affect your thinking, and there's no way around it. It is a law. Whatever you believe in your heart is going to bubble up into your soul's mind. So if we really want to change our thinking, we've got to go down to the heart level, and meditation is both a mental, a, a mind-renewing, and a heart-renewing process that reshapes the way we believe. Because most everything we think comes from something we believe. And so to renew the mind, we've got to renew the beliefs. Are we believing a lie? If you ever feel like your life is a mess, if you ever feel like you've been in a funk, if you ever feel like you can't get a breakthrough, most often the reason is because your thinking is a mess. Because 
at the end of the day, if you break it down, if you take away the complexity of it, somewhere you're believing a complex set of lies about yourself or about a situation or about God or about others. And the way to get victory is believing the truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. See, the opposite is also true. If you believe the lie, it will bondage you. It will enslave you. If you believe the lie about God, if you believe the lies about yourself, you will live as a captive, as a prisoner, and you will never have victory or breakthrough. If you keep going through the same, the same circles around the mountain over and over and over, you're probably believing a complex set of lies that need to be dismantled with truth so you believe the truth and you can have victory. And you can go forward rather than spinning your wheels to nowhere. So, so thoughts that come from the heart come from beliefs and desires. And then thoughts that come from the spirit, and we've talked about this in a previous session, are characterized by intuition, conviction, and revelation. And so learning to think about, okay, where are these thoughts coming from? Where are these thoughts coming from? So let's, let's turn in our Bibles to Romans 7, verse 23. I want to talk about here, as we wind this message up, I want to talk about the law of the mind. I want you to see this because what I'm talking about, the, the, law, the, the mind, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a law or a principle like the law of gravity that if you violate it, no, it doesn't matter how good you are, how nice you are, how good your intentions are. It's like throwing a ball up. It's going to come down. It is a, it is a law of the it is spiritual laws that God has put into place. Paul was saying, and he said, I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind. Did you catch that? The law of my mind. He's not talking about the law of Moses. He's not talking about the law of God. He's talking about what I'm talking about. There is, a, there is a set of principles related to the mind that govern how you live. The law of the mind, and because what was happening, it was making him a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. In other words, Paul was saying, in this body of flesh, Sin is at work. The cravings of my body want what it wants when it wants it. It doesn't matter of what God says I can have or what God says I can't have. My body wants what it wants when it wants it, and it's waging war against my soul, my mind, and it's because it's waging war against my mind, it's making me a prisoner. Why is it making me a prisoner? Because Paul's thinking is being affected by his flesh. When your thinking is affected by your flesh, it affects whether or not you're spiritual or carnal. It affects whether you're living from the soul, self-life in your soul, the cravings of the body, or whether you're living from the spirit in your union with the Holy Spirit. See, this law of the mind is so vital. Your thoughts, whether they're righteous or unrighteous, your thoughts, just always remember this, your thoughts determine whether you live a spirit-led, soul-led, or body-led life. If your thinking's wrong and your life's a mess, don't blame God. God's not the problem. Your thinking's the problem. If you want victory and you want God to do something in your life and you want to activate the life of God in you and release the spirit of God from within, so he lives rather than you. You've got to change the way you think. You've got to change the way you think. Uh, there was a story uh, to this week. Um, Anna and Evan and Ellie, they went jogging. And it, I don't know what they were thinking, jogging at like 95 degree heat at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. But they went jogging anyway. And so anyway, they come back to our house and, you know, their face, they come back and their faces are basically like the color of a fire truck. And I'm like, oh, what do you, why did you go run, you know, this time of day? But anyway, they, the first place they ran was up this very, very, very steep hill in our neighborhood. 
And Anna was describing it. She was like, yeah, Evan was like really kind of being mean. I was like, really, what was he saying? He was like, well, I, I, I had to walk up it, and he was running up it, and he was just saying, you don't, I, you, he was just saying that you don't have the mental toughness. You need mental toughness. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, Evan's probably right. She probably does need a little bit of mental toughness. But he, you know, it's just funny hearing him say that, trying to compete. But this, this, this mental toughness, this, this mindset. See, how important the mind is. How important the mind is to victory. If you think you can do it, you can. I'm not trying to get like all philosophical, but I'm saying even, even related to the, to the Lord, is if you are thinking, and your thinking is constantly on a lie, constantly on the flesh, constantly on what you can't do, constantly on your failures, constantly on your unworthiness, constantly on lust and what your body wants, constantly on pride and how great you are, constantly on unworthiness. I'm, I'll never amount to anything. I'll never have. I'll never be blessed. I'll never have what these people have. You know, bombarded by jealousy and envy, especially with social media. You know, if you haven't realized this yet, social media is not real, okay? Social media is not real. No one has that kind of life, all right? No one has the kind of life they portray on social media. They, everyone, puts on there their best pictures, their best moments. They don't put on there what is really going on. And so you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, they're really blessed. No, they, they took a good picture. They use a filter and they look good on the, on the filter. Their life is a mess just like your life is a mess. Don't be comparing yourself on social media to what you think these people have as a blessing. Renew your mind to that stuff. It's, it's imaginary. No one is that happy. Okay? We're all human. No one has a life that blessed. <laughs> anyway. But if you think that way, and you're constantly trapped in this comparison trap of like, okay, this person is blessed, and I'm not, and I'm sitting here, and all I do is ever stay home. I never get out of the house or whatever. And you think, this person's better than me or whatever. It, it creates this, this jealousy and envy within you that hinders you from living the life of Christ. So what's happening is your mind is thinking on something of the flesh. It's not thinking on the Spirit of God in you. It's not thinking on who Christ is in you. It's not thinking on how he has transformed your spirit and that you can live by his life, his joy, his peace. See, you're, no matter what, your meditation always determines your orientation. Whether you live a spirit-led body-led or soul-led life. It is a law. It cannot be uh, undone. It, it is an absolute law. You know, whether you recognize it or whether you don't recognize it, that law operates whether you uh, agree with it or don't agree with it, like it or dislike it. That is a law. The way you think determines the way you live. Who you put your thoughts upon, whether the flesh or the spirit, determines whether you're spiritual or carnal. The, the, see, there is no excuse. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. The mindset on the flesh is death. If you feel as if your life is a mess and you're experiencing spiritual death, it's because your mind is set on the flesh, 100%. It is a law that cannot be violated if you want to live a victorious spirit-led life. It's like the laws of gravity, aerodynamics, and thermodynamics. These laws cannot be violated. They, they operate no matter what. And so what I want to say is this law of the mind, this law of thinking is connected with what Paul said, the law of faith. In Romans, um, in, in, in the book of Romans, Paul said there's a, the law of faith in Romans 3.27. The law of the mind and the law of faith are connected. The mind activates faith. Faith releases the spirit from within. If your thinking's bad, your, your faith will be dormant. If your faith is dormant, the spirit will be suppressed in you. If you want to change your life, change your thinking, change your meditation. That will activate faith. Okay, so let's turn now to Romans 8.5. Is this making sense? We're going to go deep in this. So this is just the introduction Paul said that those who are according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh. In other words, 
the people, even believers, if they are living by the flesh, it's because their mind is set on the things of the flesh. It could be a million things. What the body wants, jealousy, envy, you know, what I want, selfish ambition, selfishness, soulishness. It could be, you know, I'm unworthy, I'm, you know, I'm bitter, I'm rejected, I'm, you know, a million things. I'm controlling, I gotta have my way, I gotta be the one in charge. But those who are according to the Spirit, those who are living by the Spirit, those who are living from their human spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit in that spirit-to-spirit -spirit union with Christ, the ones who are doing that are the ones who have set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Like uh, Paul said in Philemon, he said, meditate, acknowledge the good that is in you. Well, how do you get into this, from the flesh into the Spirit? You get into the flesh you get from the flesh into the spirit by meditation, by thinking differently. Now let's turn to Romans 12, verse 2. As we wrap this up. Paul said, do not be conformed to this world. If you don't practice meditation, biblical meditation on the truth, you will be conformed to this world. You absolutely will be conformed to the spirit of this age. Your thinking will be conformed to the spirit of this age. Your mindsets will be conformed to the spirit of this age. Your mind will be conformed. You will be conformed to the spirit of this age and the spirit of the age, Satan, the prince of the power of the air, who is controlling and influencing culture, that will influence you if you are, if you are not purposely renewing your mind. But Paul said, be transformed. That word transform is metamorphosis. It's, metamor yeah, it's the metamorphu, which we get the English word metamorphosis. Th see, that, this, this kind of transformation is something you do. Now, as you take, again, this, obviously, God's always the one who works prior to. God is, God's grace is always prior, but God is waiting for you to take the steps for your own transformation. And if you take the steps for your own transformation and you start renewing your mind, what happens is you begin to experience a metamorphosis. You begin to change states. You begin to change. See, you can be, in a, as a Christian, you can be either in a carnal state or a spiritual state. And that, the, whichever state you're in is all determined by the mind and your thinking. Is your mind being conformed by the spirit of the age or is your mind being transformed by the word of God? It's up to you. God's not going to do this for you. God's not going to just zap you one day and automatically change you in one instant. Transformation be begins with God, but it must be responded to by us by taking deliberate uh, habits, making deliberate habits in prayer of renewing the mind so that we are being changed and transformed from one state, from a fleshly, carnal state, into a spiritual state of the life of Jesus Christ flowing out of us to produce spiritual fruit. That must mean my sign to stop. A little bit more here. This Greek word for renewing comes from a word meaning to cause, up, to, cause to grow up, to make new, to be changed into a new kind of life as opposed to the former corrupt state. See, as you begin meditating on Christ in you and the things of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of you, he wants to have a relationship with you. Don't ignore the third person of the Trinity. He's in you. You don't always have to look up into heaven to try to communicate with God. He is right here. And if you set your mind on him who dwells inside of you, it will shift your state. It will metamorphosize you. It will transform you. You can experience transformation 
by the renewing of your mind. You don't have to live your life in a mess and be a mess if you will learn how to think differently. And I'm not talking about the, the, the way the world thinks. I'm talking about thinking differently based on the truth of God's word. The truth of God's word. See, meditation draws out the newness of your spirit and puts down the oldness of your flesh. The new man that is, that is your spirit, that has been created in righteousness and holiness and Christ-likeness, meditation, that's what Paul said, put off the old man, put on the new man uh, by renewing the spirit of your mind. The, the renewing of the mind is how you transition from putting off the old man that is being corrupted by lust to putting on the new man that, is being, that, is, that has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Read it's Ephesians chapter 4. Put off the old man, put on the new man by renewing the spirit of your mind. See, we, we some, you know, even saying to God, we, uh, help me to put off the new man. Help me put, uh, put, on, or put off the old man. Help me put on the new man. And the Lord's like, okay, renew your mind. No, Lord, I want you to do it. And they're like, no, I've called you to do it. I've called you to do it. Now, if you do your part, I will do my part, but I'm not going to do the part I've given to you. The part I've given to you is to renew your mind. And if you renew your mind, what will happen is you will begin to believe again, and that faith will activate the indwelling spirit to make it real in your experience. So metamorphosis, metamorphosize, changing the way you think is, is so critical, so vital to living by the Spirit of God. Like I said, we're going to just go, we're going to go deep in this. We're going to spend, I don't know how long, but we're going, to just, we're, we're going to just go deep in this because it's very important that the church of Jesus Christ learns to how to renew their mind by meditating on God's word. Amen. Amen. I'm going to close there. Father, we love you. And Lord, we just thank you for the word of the Lord, the scriptures, the Holy Spirit. Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, that you would train us to think differently. Father, where we have been, I'm just going to pray as we enter this new season. As we enter this new season, Lord, I pray that, I pray, Lord, as we enter this new season, that you would begin exposing by the Spirit of God lies that we have believed. Lies we have believed from the devil. Lies about ourselves. Lies about, lies about others. Lies about God. Lies about our situation. Lies, lies, lies. Would you expose lies, Lord? Would you allow the, the sharp two-edged sword of your word right now to begin to divide between soul and spirit? so that we could see the truth from lies and help us to understand, Lord, help us to understand the truth so that we would know the truth and be set free. I'm asking you, Lord, for freedom, freedom to come to many, many people in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, would you, in the name of Jesus, just release freedom to your people so that we could, we could change our thinking and make that shift into the spirit-led life. Lord, we ask you for that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.